G'day and welcome to another episode of Perth Property Insider. I'm your host, Jared Mann. And today I'm answering some of the questions getting asked on our Perth Property Investment Facebook group. If you're not already a member, make sure you head over in and join in the conversations. Be good to get your input on anything and get help from other investors too. So check it out on Facebook, Perth Property Investment Group. Now, what sort of stuff are we covering today? We've got lots of uh, interesting questions. I chose some really juicy ones going into what are some of the books I recommend for Australian property investor sort of experts. I'm looking into places to buy with different budgets involved, what would be considered good metrics when you're looking for a investment property. I'm going into both the cash flow side of a strategy and the capital growth side. What what's good? What numbers? Then I'm going into some other suburbs that people are asking about, which one I'd choose out of them. That's going to be an interesting segment. And finally, a lot of people have been asking if we know a good property manager. So maybe I haven't been clear enough on uh, us being a specialist in that area, but I'm going to go into some of the reasons why it's so hard to find a good property manager and why we've got that solved. So let's go inside. Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management specialist servicing the whole of Perth. Now, here is your host, Jared Mann. Today is going to be a very interesting episode because I've got some juicy questions that I'm going to throw my two cents, my opinion at, and keep in mind that I don't know the person's whole situation. And this is not financial or property investment advice. Make sure you get in touch with professionals before making any important decisions. Now, the first question from someone on the Perth Property Investment Group, please give me reading recommendations for a new property investor in Australia. Now, one of my top Books to check out. Some of these are on audio, some of them aren't, but I'll try to mention where to get them as well. So I really like Michael Yardney's books. He's been on the podcast quite a few times. Uh, he's been a bit of a mentor to me ever since I was 16 and on the Summersoft Property Investment Forums back in the day, trying to plan out my first investment property purchase. He was on there helping me, very active in those days. And I've subsequently really gone deep into his books, read them a lot of times. My two favorite ones are How to Grow a Multi-Million Dollar Property Portfolio in Your Spare Time. Definitely worth reading. Must read for every Australian property investor. And Rich Habits, Poor Habits. Never really placed as much importance on that second one of the Rich Habits, Poor Habits But lately, um, as you'd know from the trend in my topics, I'm really finding that it's what uh, happens on the inside and your whole thinking and mindset around wealth that makes the biggest difference. So why not model what the rich do and uh, look to adopt their habits so that it becomes autonomous and second nature? And that's why that second book's really good. Now, another author that's been on the podcast that quite regularly is Stuart Wames. He's from Pro Solution Private Clients, and he's got a really great book called Investopoly, The Eight Golden Rules of Mastering the Game of Building Wealth. So definitely worth checking out. That's available on digital, um, Amazon, and hard copy. I believe both of Michael's are as well in both those formats. Definitely worth reading. And it doesn't just cover property, but more of the overall mindset to play the game of wealth and how some other asset classes may link in with your property so that you can create that overall passive income when you want it. Next one. I love uh, Bryce Holdaway and Ben Kingsley's book. Bryce has been on the podcast too. The Armchair Guide to Property Investing, How to Retire on $2,000 a Week, a really good foundational book to get your principles in check and look at the different property types that might go into an overall portfolio to create that passive income of $2,000 a week. Great book and worth reading. That's in audio uh, on Audible as well as 
hard copy and digital. So I really enjoyed the audio because I prefer learning that way. So check that out if it's to your taste. Finally, my last book, which I mention a lot and is definitely worth mentioning again because I couldn't leave it out, is John Safarek's book, The Wealthy Gardener, Lessons on Prosperity Between a Father and Son. Just a really enjoyable book to read, I find, because it's part fictional story and part nonfiction principles of wealth that reinforce the story as you go. And I've listened to this on audio, on Audible, many, many times and definitely worth checking out if you haven't already. i try and get John on the show sometime. Hopefully we can. On to the next question. So this person said, I'm looking for another investment and I wonder about the areas in Perth. Any recommendations up to around 500k property price? I like north of the river suburbs. I have some there that perform good. Any ideas south of the river that perform good in the long term? And he's wanting a buy and hold strategy. Thanks for posting that on the group. I know some people have chimed in with their answers, but I wanted to give mine so that everyone can listen and hopefully pick some things up as well. So when I look at the 30-year average annual growth rate, and then I and that data is uh, you know, not, not available anywhere as far as I'm aware. I had it prepared and commissioned Rewa to do that for me. It took a lot of begging, pleading, and befriending the research team there. Not publicly available as far as I'm aware anywhere. I take that data, I then overlay that with the short-term sort of trend analysis of the suburbs at individual price points. So we want to align the long-term performance through proven history with short-term analysis to look at what's trending the right way still, what's going to give you, what's most likely to give you that growth upspurt in the short term. And when I look at all the suburbs at that sort of 500k price point, now we can look less uh, as well, but I've more focused in on that maximizing and buying the best quality of property that you can, which many of you would know I'm a big advocate of. My two picks, one for north of the river would be Marangaroo, really good, solid family suburb that's relatively undervalued still compared to neighboring ones and Rockingham in the south. So there was a lot of investor-focused activity in the neighbouring suburbs to Rockingham last year. I think Rockingham's relatively undervalued still and coastal, and uh, there's a lot of good industry supporting things down there as well. So if you want to know other suburbs to buy at your price points and or more suburbs to buy at 500k so that you've got uh, more options, Look at getting our buyer's info pack, which is on our website. You can go to investorsedge.com.au slash invest and order our buyer's info pack there. Only $220 at the moment and great value because we not only give our suburb recommendations, we give our ideal criteria to overlay so that you've got the suburb, the area, the property and can drill down to really choose that property. And we've also got our for an acceptance conditions that can really help you with protecting yourself. Some su- They're just suggested ones. You obviously need to go and get it checked out by a settlement agent and or solicitor if you wish. And we've got our suggested service providers in there as well. So you can deck out your team and have a, an A team on your side. So hopefully that helps that person and others listening that are looking to buy in Perth because we've still got some really great buying and um, those that came along to John Lindemann's event. It was really good the other week. He's predicting a boom for Perth where you can almost throw dart at a board and do well in the next two to three years. So that was very encouraging that one of the best and most accurate researchers in Australia is uh, seeing Perth as the place to buy. Next question. So what would be considered good metrics for a rental investment property in Perth right now? And they queried a few things like yield, uh, internal rate of return. It really comes down to what is your strategy. Are you looking for cash flow, more focus on cash flow, or a more focus on growth? And that can be often be driven as well by your plan, hopefully, if you've got one, the top level, so that you know what type of property, what price point you're looking to acquire and what your portfolio needs as far as 
cash flow uh, to make it sustainable and you know be able to make the next purchase as well in due course once you get enough deposit and or equity together. So you got your plan to guide that. If you don't have a plan, hopefully we will soon be able to help you with putting a plan together, working on it. But I want to be able to do it properly and do it consistently in a way that's going to help clients uh, really get clear on things. So working on that and hope to have that out sometime in the future. Not putting a time frame on it because I want to get it right. But once you've got your plan, then the other main factor is going to drive this, which goes into your plan, is your borrowing capacity. So and also your budget and what you can sort of afford on a weekly basis to be able to put into the property. So obviously, if your ability to save is relatively low, you're going to be leaning more towards cash flow, especially if you know you don't have that money each week around for negative a negatively geared property that's going to be more of a higher growth focused property. So if you are chasing growth and you've got that cash flow to use for it, look, a growth type property really is going to be the most economical way for you to grow your asset base because the property is there compounding. Yes, you're paying some negatively, yes, you're negatively geared and you've got some cash flow to tip in along the way. But all of the growth and the growth components larger and that'll be capitalizing um, compounding without paying tax until till when and if you ever sold it so you should be looking to get a greater than six percent average annual growth rate moving forward and for it to have had a proven history of that in the past and if you can get above 7%, that's excellent uh, because even this 1% or 2% extra, as you'll find, makes a massive difference in the overall compounding, especially when you draw it out over 20 or 30 years. So you're likely to get that sort of growth with a lower rental yield of around 25 to 3.5% yield, which, of course, when you compare with the East Coast, is still relatively very good. And you would argue that we're most likely in Perth to have that shorter that growth over the shorter term as well as the longer term. So you're not gonna have shouldn't have to wait too long, I don't think, for it. You should be getting it straight away if you're buying the right areas. Now, if you're chasing yield and not growth, that's where you know you don't have as much cash flow per week to uh, stomach a negatively geared property, or your strategy dictates that you want to accumulate more towards the yield and to give you, I guess, not as much strain ongoingly, or you're trying to, you know, you feel like, yeah, you want to just go straight for the cash flow and not grow the asset base. I don't agree with just going straight for the cash flow approach because often people aren't going to have a big enough asset base to actually give them the cash flow that they want. By the time they do their numbers, it makes more sense to grow the capital base first. The most economical way to do that is with a high growth property. But again, you have to be able to afford it. So cash flow properties are great for being able to afford through good times and bad, not having pressure on your situation. And there's no right or wrong with either. If you're getting in and you're buying properties and you're building portfolio, I say, you know, you're going to be far better off than the average person. So don't think there's any one right way, all case by case and what suits you. So if chasing yield, a 5.5% yield is solid for properties in Perth and anything at sort of 6 to 6.5% is excellent percent yield. And you're likely to then achieve, as a result of that higher yield, you're likely to then achieve a 4 to 5% growth rate over the long term. Now, because of the stage of the cycle we're at, you're probably going to get some, you know, much larger growth than that initially, but then it's going to more settle to that 4 to 5% over the long term. And that initial growth may still enable you to be able to withdraw your deposit out, cycle that into another property. And if you uh, choose your suburbs, choose your timing well, then you know, you can keep doing that as well. Now, it really comes back to your plan and what strategy is going to help you get there. And personally, as I mentioned, I think you need to grow your asset base first and then convert that capital into income producing later because it's the most efficient way to have your money compound without getting taxed, which is really key. Next question. Out of Canning Vale, Gosnells, Harrisdale, Cannington and Maddington, what would you think has a relatively higher growth rate the long-term basis? I want to know your thoughts. So I'm going to group three of these suburbs together because they've unfortunately historically performed pretty poorly. 
That's Cannington, Maddington and Gosnells. Look, while they are lower priced and you would expect a lesser growth from them and more yield, they've all performed below average over the long last 30 years. So Maddington's had 4.27%, average annual growth rate, Gosnell's 4.36 and Cannington 4.18 did the worst of the three. And it's such a shame that Cannington just doesn't have the growth because it's closest to Perth of the three. It's got great amenities, Long Albany Highway there and the Carousel Shopping Centre is fabulous with the cinema and everything. But there's just a lot of land supply in there still, and it just doesn't have the desirability that drives a lot of other suburbs. So uh, as a result, it has not performed well, and I don't expect that to change over the long term for these suburbs. Now, they're likely to have a rental yield of 5 to 6%, depending on the house. So you do have a bit of a better rental yield than that. But I don't see that growth rate changing over the long term, and you'll likely get Still get a surge over the next two to three years, so don't kick yourself if you're born in there. You'll still you know, have some reasonable uptick in the next two to three years. I'm just talking about what's most optimum for the long term in answering this question. So I'd say there are better choices out there for the same money and get our buyer's info pack if you want our recommendations. Now, what are the other suburbs he asked about there? He mentioned Harrisdale. So by my account, Harrisdale has still got a lot of land to come on all around it. It's become a lot more established over the last five years, but being a relatively new suburb, I also don't have the history of evidence to say how it may perform in the future. However, over the last 15 years, though, even through what has been a rather difficult Perth market, it's still managed to average 5.5% annual growth rate each year. So that appears on the face of it to be quite reasonable. And look, it is a nice area to live and it is quite desirable. And while building costs are going to keep going up and while the land supply is still tight, the suburb will likely do quite well as well because it does have a lot of new housing. It's still attractive. It's still relatively close to Perth and does have a lot more amenities in the town centre there. So just wouldn't necessarily be my first choice longer term because of that. If you pull up the map, you can see there's a lot of land supply on the back of Harrisdale that, you know, will come on at some point and it's going to, you know, work on keeping prices suppressed, I believe. Now, the last suburb, and I'm saving the best for last year, Canning Vale would be my pick of all of these suburbs. It's got two new train stations coming in soon. That's going to improve its accessibility. It's got really good primary schools. It's a sh- the one missing ingredient for Canningvale is a really great public high school. So a lot of people start there with their kids in primary public school, send their kids to private high school, or move when their kids are going to high school. So if just unlike you know Willerton and Ross Moyne that have those wonderful high schools, public high schools. It'd be awesome if Canning Vale had that one missing ingredient to see it go to the next level in line with those other suburbs I just mentioned. So now with Canning Vale being built up all around it with no land supply surrounding it, it's likely to perform even better than its historical growth rate, which has done 6.08% over the last 20 years. So really solid, good growth rate over the last 20 years. And I don't have data going back the full 30 years because I suspect it was uh, founded not too long after the 20-year mark. So now our last question, and Dwayne, my colleague, continuously tells me, Jared, you need to be more direct about Investors Edge, your company being a property management specialist and the go-to I say to Drain, look, I try. I don't want to hit people over the face with it, but people on our Perth Property Investment Group Facebook group have not got the message. I had so many questions about who to use for a property manager, so I'm going to address it really directly in this question and do a whole episode on it, which you may listen to in the next one. Still working on it. Uh, so, what has this person said? Let's go into this, eh? Because it's very commonplace not just uh, in Perth Property Investment Group, but all around forums and when I go to events. Until people find us, they're wondering, is anyone, does anyone know a really good property manager? One that's happy to communicate regularly and is thorough. Had some really average ones, 
So I'm looking for a proactive property manager. Do they exist? Yep. Feel your pain because that was my experience too. When I was trying to find a property manager before starting Investor's Edge, I had four property managers at the time. They were absolutely driving me nuts, not returning calls and emails. I'd have to follow. I'd call it managing my manager. So that frustration is very real. And you think that good communication and attention to detail would be very basic, wouldn't you? And the minimum standard that property managers would hold. However, it's the top frustration we hear from investors coming to us each month that are just absolutely fed up with their existing service. And so why is it the case? Let's go into some of the reasons why, on the face of it, communication and attention to detail should be easy. Property management should be easy. <laughs> Oh, I'm laughing because if any of my team listen to this, they know how much is involved in running a really tight property management. And it all starts with the standards that the company has that each property manager lives and works by. We have a ridiculously responsive guarantee. So that root guarantee is to return all calls and emails in the same business day or we pay you $100. I've had that guarantee, I think, for about 10 years at least, maybe 11 or 12 years. Dreamt it up in the shower one day. How can we show investors that communication is our most important thing and how can we get ensure that we get back to people in the same business day when they have a genuine question? And it doesn't mean that we've got the answer all the time just means we're going to keep you updated and that we might be working on it. And uh, I think that's what gives people the greatest peace of mind in working with our property management service. So I think a lot of other managers would go broke if they tried offering this. They'd go broke in a week. Now, what's the other reasons that managers fail to deliver on the basics? So we've mentioned standards not being high enough. The next big one is the drowning and the burnout that occurs. So it is a really tough job. When, especially when you don't have the expertise and, you know, maturity and life skills behind you, and there's a lot that goes into being a good property manager. You need that attention to detail. You need good systems and processes that you follow to the letter. You need to have the full support of admin behind you to handle a lot of the tedious stuff. And you need the support of management to really understand and help you through difficult situations and provide you extra team support when you're in your peak periods and, you know, holiday coverage so that when you come back from holidays, things aren't an absolute mess. And the problem with property management is the work never stops. You can can easily get on top of a manager, especially if they've been given too many properties to manage. Now, what is too many properties to manage, I hear you say? Well, it's not a set number and it's really difficult. You can't go around saying, well, how many properties do you manage? It's such a broad question that it's worth asking, I guess, but you know, there's a lot that goes into someone's capacity to deliver on that number of properties. So there's a lot of aspects, including the ones that I just mentioned above, but then it comes down to the quality of your tenant selection. Obviously, if you've got tenants that are causing issues that are in arrears, that are damaging properties, that chews up time massively. So quality of tenant selection is so important and we focus, that's why we have a quality tenant guarantee as well, um, that if we ever have to evict a tenant, we'll cover the cost to release the property. We've got a, the other thing is maintaining the condition of your properties. If you keep that really tight, then you're only dealing with, you know, small stuff as it comes up. You don't let it all build up and have a massive problem when you come to vacate the tenant. That's where Owners end up with a lot of cost overrun because it goes over and above the bond. Tenants end up feeling very surprised because no one had told them about these things along the way. And we'd rather address them along the way and have the tenant, you know, enter a payment plan or come up with the funds ahead of time and just not let things build up. And then when we come in to do our inspections, we can notice something very quickly that might be out of place and get it sorted so that it doesn't build up. So again, has a huge bearing on uh, the ability for a manager to manage more properties. Now, the other things in here is turnover of tenants. So if tenants aren't enjoying the management experience, we know that they leave and change uh, tenancies much quicker. If we're not selecting tenants that have a long-term desire to be in a property and we're not screening that properly, then you can end up with a lot of shorter-term tenants that you might have not otherwise chosen. And if 
when the market's hard and it's difficult to lease, that all reduces the number of properties that a manager can look after too. So all of these have a huge bearing on how many can be effectively managed. And what I do know is when a manager's drowning, and that's not based on a number of properties, but based on their workload and how they're handling it, look, they often know that they're letting people down, but they don't have the support or the capacity to catch up. And that leads to burnout. And finally, the property manager quits and leaves. And there's a huge turnover of managers that is continuously happening in in the industry, thankfully. All of my team have been with me a very long time. Love, we all love working together. Got a great culture and they get the support. And they need to be able to take holidays, to have a great work life balance and to get great results for our clients and feel like they, you know, that they're being rewarded for it. So a revolving door often occurs where this the new property manager is thrown in the deep end and immediately put under pressure. And then they find all the hidden problems that the last manager's uh, not gotten around to. And they've, you know, the issues have gone from small things to grown to being much larger emergencies that take even more time. So that revolving door and changing of manager is a real big problem. And it's tough, so tough for the incoming manager to try and get on top of. Now, here, thankfully, uh, we run, run a really tight ship. We have the highest of standards. And each manager has a minimum of seven years experience and they have key performance indicators, which we track and review on a weekly basis to ensure that the portfolio is kept really tight and they have an investment mindset. So they understand where our clients are coming from and they are always trying to improve their returns. You know, they troubleshoot maintenance, they review the rent in, in line with market, they, you know, negotiate and and try to get the most out of tenants, especially in this market. So we're getting record prices when we release. All of this goes into improving the returns and giving peace of mind. So I'm so proud of the team and grateful to have them working for me. And it's why we're one of the most highly rated on Google with over 600 reviews and most awarded in Australia. So if you are looking for a property manager, check us out, investorsedge.com.au. And thanks for bearing with me while I dive deeper into that question and hopefully we won't have as many people asking on the group because it tells me they haven't checked us out or they don't know that we do it. So thanks for tuning in. Hopefully these answers can help with your investing plans. If you have any specific questions for me, get in touch. Just a reminder, the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature as we don't know your specific situation. You should always seek professional advice before taking any action. For free market reports on your suburbs of interest and other helpful resources to grow your wealth, make sure you join my property investor update at investorsedge.com.au slash join. And finally, make sure you're a member of our Perth Property Investment Facebook group. To be part of the conversation with other like-minded investors, get help to your questions and get a feel for what's going on out there in the market. I'll see you in the group. Thank you.